Oke, okay. uh, good. Uh, welcome to our class, uh, organizational psychology, uh, which is taught by four lecturers. Uh, there is uh, Bu, I, Bu Nur Rahmani, Bu Sri Hartati, Pak Sito Mayanto, and myself, Indra, and I will be your moderator in this guest lecture session. So it is a great honor uh, for us to have you, Chris, here. Well, likewise, it's an honor for yes. you to invite us. Thank you very it's much for inviting us. Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, we are waiting for this moment since yeah, a couple months ago. Okay. We offer you to join with our guest lecture session. So this is yeah, this is a, a happy moment uh, for us today. And I also thanks to the uh, my student here, the audience uh, from graduate student, uh, regular and international, and then uh, postgraduate student and doctoral students and also uh, our partners in uh, unit of uh, human resource uh, uh, quality improvement. So we have uh, one unit in our faculty that, uh, that has a business about uh, uh, consulting and assessing uh, people in the organization. So uh, the, the unit names is OPKM. So our partners also joined with uh, our guest lecture session this morning. So previously, I would like to ask all the attendees uh, uh, to switch uh, microphone and switch on the video. So we can see all of you and we also will see the attendees, please switch on your uh, video during this session. Okay, so Chris, uh, this discussion will at last two, two hours. So one hours, I will deliver this uh, session to you and the rest uh, one hours uh, will be uh, questions and answer. But it's depend on you if you're going to deliver your material in a short time, for instance. But it told me that you're going to deliver in 30 minutes and you are really keen to discuss with this audience. So uh, you, can, you can do that. And then uh, we will, uh, I'll try two minutes of the discussion. Okay. This. Yeah, yes, lecture. Okay, so I will uh, briefly read your CV first, Chris. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Chris. Toffer Eric Evans. Uh, he is an Australian, but he just uh, told me just now that he's already become an Indonesian. <laughs> okay, so he's pursuing his bachelor degree at the University of Western Australia in Perth with a major in management science. Uh, furthermore, he continued his master studies in the USA at the University of Phoenix, Arizona in accounting. He started his career at the ODG companies in 1996. So it's already 25 years. Correct, yes. correct, in the one company, right. yes. Yes, and serve uh, as a project leader to a manager in the work area of the ODG company in several regions in Indonesia, such as Sumbawa, Sangata, etc. So, and finally, in 2017, he became the president director of uh, the ODG Indonesia company until now. And it was an amazing work experience, actually, Chris, being a management cycle and interacting with the diversity cultures in Indonesia. You've yes. already been in Sangata, you've already been in Sumbawa, and I think it will become an interesting topic for us right now because uh, we bring our topic today is cross-culture perspective. So okay. a lot of students are really keen to uh, help your yeah, wisdom and your experience, your knowledge about this. So uh, I invite you, Chris, uh, to start your uh, speak and uh, please. Thanks, Sabindra. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Uh, yes, we've been very lucky uh, to have worked with Ibunur from uh, UGM, um, who came on board with us soon after I became president director. Uh, we brought Ibunur on board. Um, to help us really uh, evaluate the business. Uh, we did a SWOT analysis is when I first took over with the, the management team. And from that, we started identifying that we needed to 
you know, clarify the vision of the business, uh, the mission of the business, and then, um, you know, develop some of the structures we're going to talk about today um, to align uh, the behaviour of our employees with what we are aiming to achieve. Um, and I think in that time, I think we have blended the two cultures, the Western cultures and the Indonesian culture, I think. Um, okay. You know, where, yeah. uh, you know, we, you know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's not possible just to, uh, you know, adopt a whole set of Western values to a different, to a different country. And i had been here a long time anyway. So I already had a, a decent idea of the culture, but I still learned a lot actually by talking with my people um, and learning, you know, um, really more about the culture of Indonesia and, mm -hmm. and how we do things. So you are worthy to be our great guest lecturer. Right I, I hope so. I hope I'm worthy. We'll find out in two hours if I'm worthy or not. Thank um, you, Chris. And in that journey, I've been helped a lot by uh, Ibu Sufi. Uh, oh, I see. Became our Sufi. HR manager. Um, uh, Sufi had. Uh, worked with me throughout. I, I've known Sophie for well, at least 20 <laughs> years, you know, at, as she works through the organisation. And uh, she's been a great partner, someone who's very supportive and very open to new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we had one of your graduates, uh, Miss Oven. Uh, okay, she, came on, she came on board as an intern and then stayed. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> we saw great value in what she was doing and her insights. And she okay. was a very hard worker and uh, a great part of the team. So okay. it became a team of myself, Ibu Sulfi, Bunur and Oven. Uh, we've okay. tackled a lot of things in the company. It's been a really, really interesting journey so far and there's still lots to do in what we're doing. Um, so I, I think uh, to do the presentation, I, what we've talked about is that I think Ibu Sulfi will uh, start off the presentation. We've got a PowerPoint presentation. And she'll run through the first seven slides, which is a bit of an introduction to the business. And then together, uh, I'll talk about then the uh, different initiatives we've done uh, in performance management. And, uh, and then we can talk at the end, we talk about uh, the effects of COVID and how that's affected the business and talk about uh, the future where we're heading. So maybe if Sophie wants to start off the presentation, okay. share your screen, okay. Sophie. Silakan, Sophie. Okay. Uh, sudah kelihatan ya presentasinya? Yep. Sudah. Oke, okay, okay. bagi teman-teman sekalian, Bu Sulfi adalah HRD di PT ODG. Nah, beliau akan menyampaikan uh, terkait dengan company profile ya, Bu, ya? Iya, yeah, betul. Okay, monggo, Bu. Ya. Yeah. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, selamat pagi. Salam sejahtera buat kita semua. Perkenalkan, saya Sulfi, HR Manager uh, PT ODG Indonesia. Jadi, uh, saya akan um, memperkenalkan nih ODG itu apa sih gitu ya siapa dan apa sih yang sudah dilakukan uh, selama ini gitu ya jadi ODG ini berdiri sejak tahun 1990 tepatnya sudah 31 tahun uh, berdiri dengan uh, apa namanya dengan uh, perusahaan konstruksi yang berpengalaman dan me dengan menyelesaikan proyek-proyek yang kompleks dan mengerjakan dengan tepat waktu, lalu dengan dilakukan juga dengan standar internasional dengan mengutamakan keselamatan karyawan dan berupaya untuk uh, melindungi lingkungan sekitar. Karena kita berada di uh, bisnis konstruksi dan lokasi pekerjaan uh, klien kita uh, sebagian besar di area mining dan manufacturing, maka sebagian uh, besar tenaga kerja kita adalah uh, blue color ya. Nah, blue color ini sangat berperan besar dalam operasional perusahaan karena tanpa mereka proyek tidak akan berjalan lancar. Di samping itu mereka juga memiliki keterampilan ya dan bahkan sertifikasi di setiap bidangnya. Lalu sekarang apa saja sih yang dilakukan PT ODG? Perusahaan menyediakan beberapa jasa konstruksi, maintenance seperti instalasi listrik desain procurement instalasi untuk fire detection dan fire protection, uh, plumbing, dan air conditioning. Jadi ini uh, ODG merupakan salah satu kontraktor electrical, uh, uh, electrical, fire, dan mechanical, dan menawarkan solusi melalui rangkaian, rangkaian service uh, dalam satu rangkaian yang lengkap gitu ya. Jadi... 
Uh, Mungkin saya nambah Bu. Boleh. Kayaknya tuh kerjanya sepele gitu ya, tapi itu kerjanya tuh di tengah hutan. Iya. Nyara. Kebanyakan ada juga yang di remote area ya untuk mencapai lapangan itu, proyek itu kita ber, belasan jam untuk mencapai itu. Jadi dengan uh, berbagai uh, kendala transportasi dan apa namanya medan di sana ya. Itu sudah kita lalui gitu kan. Kenapa ini nggak bisa next ya? I cannot next. Suka gitu memang. Ah, oke. Okay. Selanjutnya. Ah. Oke, okay. ini adalah tentang sejarah UDJ. Dari mana sih asalnya dan bagaimana akhirnya menjadi PT UDJ Indonesia? Jadi di ODG itu berasal dari Odidil Griffin sebenarnya yang uh, uh, yang berasal dari uh, Australia dan New Zealand. Jadi sebagai kontraktor yang mempunyai pengalaman 100 tahun waktu itu setelah uh, di sana ya. Jadi itu ODG itu dulu adalah kepanjangan dari Odidil Griffin. Lalu uh, tahun 1994 uh, ODG uh, ODG Indonesia diakuisisi dengan ODG Wormal. Jadi akhirnya berubah menjadi ODG Warmark Indonesia. Lalu kita menjadi bagian dari multinasional ya, menjadi PT ODG Indonesia, Warmark Indonesia. Lalu kita fokus di bisnis inti yaitu electrical, mechanical dan fire. Lalu ODG Warmark dipertahankan oleh Taiko pada tahun 2004 ketika grup menjual operation di operation di Australia dan Selandia Baru. Lalu pada tahun 2011 terjadi akuisisi yang disupport oleh manajemen Areas dan kembali menjadi nama aslinya yaitu PT ODG Indonesia. Lalu pada tahun 2012 perusahaan mendirikan operation di Papua New Guinea dengan nama ODG PNG yang di yang berkantor di Port Moresby dan sampai sekarang terus berkembang. Lalu selanjutnya adalah visi perusahaan yaitu bagaimana per Perusahaan menjadi terkenal di sektor uh, pertambangan, komersial, minyak dan gas manufaktur, dan konstruksi. Dan dianggap sebagai uh, kontraktor kelas dunia oleh pelanggan serta menjadi perusahaan yang dihormati karena nilai-nilainya dan berinvestasi pada pengembangan jangka panjang dan kesuksesan karyawannya. Di sini peran HR juga uh, Uh, besar juga dalam mewujudkan mimpi ini ya. Jadi kita juga harus meningkatkan standar kualitas karyawan, membantu perusahaan menanamkan budaya budaya perusahaan dan menjaga efektivitas uh, uh, dan produktivitas. Lalu sekarang bagaimana langkah-langkah untuk mencapai visi perusahaan? Di sini ada empat uh, misi yang uh, ODG lakukan adalah satu memberikan solusi untuk kebutuhan pelanggan kami akan sistem elektrikal, fire dan mekanikal. Kami adalah kontraktor multisektor dan satu titik tujuan untuk pelanggan. Yang kedua adalah berkomitmen menyediakan lingkungan yang aman bagi karyawan di mana mereka dapat bekerja sama dalam komunitas dan saling mendukung dan beretika dan saling menghormati satu sama lain di mana kebutuhan pengembangan jangka panjang mereka penuhi. Yang ketiga adalah menyelesaikan proyek yang kompleks dengan tepat waktu sesuai standar internasional dan industri. Dan yang keempat adalah mendukung perlindungan lingkungan lokal dan memastikan bahwa kami membantu komunikasi, komunikat, komunitas lokal sedapat mungkin dengan menyediakan lapangan kerja dan mengembangkan serta berkontribusi pada kesejahteraan masyarakat setempat. Nah, di sini peran ICAR juga menanamkan nilai-nilai budaya yang uh, baik dan memenuhi pengembangan skill karyawan di sini dan uh, berkontribusi pada kesejahteraan karyawan khususnya dan masyarakat sekitar pada umumnya. Could I add something there, Sophie? Yes. Is that uh, the vision, the vision we had a, um, a weekend away Uh, with myself and the, the senior managers in Ibn Nur, where we worked on the vision and clarified what was important as the leaders of the business. Yeah. And then this mission, this was developed then with the next level down of all of our managers, department managers, functional managers, 
we had a meeting where we identified all the different items and we brainstormed and we cut it down and, and cut out and added in and combined, and compromised and negotiated and had all those discussions to yeah. end up with this final wording for the mission. So it was important not just what the mission is but also how we, how we arrived at the mission was involving uh, all of our, our key managers in the business. Yeah, okay. Uh, di slide ini bisa terlihat project-project uh, uh, ODG yang sudah diselesaikan. Jadi ada sekitar 400 project yang telah selesai. Jadi ini dari Sabang sampai Merauke ya kelihatannya. Jadi di Kalimantan ada project Sangata, Bontang, Bengalon, Adaro melawan Seruyung ya dan banyak lagi dan di Sumatera untuk saat ini ada Martabe project. Di Sulawesi ada Tokatindung Gosowong, lalu di uh, daerah timur ada Ma uh, Wetar ya kalau nggak salah di situ dan uh, di Jawa Bar di Jawa Nestle Cikarang dan banyak lagi. Ini adalah proyek proyek gambaran proyek yang sudah kita uh, selesaikan. Lalu eh, karyawan kami di sini eh, terdiri dari dua jenis ya, permanen dan kontrak di sini bisa terlihat. Dan untuk karyawan permanen rata-rata orang eh, di sini bekerja dengan masa kerja yang panjang ya. Di sini bisa kita lihat bahwa eh, mungkin untuk rata-rata 20 tahun ya untuk masa kerja mereka. Untuk yang permanen antara eh, field staff dengan di staff juga di sini. Dan juga untuk karyawan uh, kontrak, di sini mereka uh, masa kerjanya disesuaikan dengan durasi proyek uh, di mana kita uh, mendapat proyek di sana um, bisa short, short term, bisa bisa long term, dan itu tergantung dari uh, durasi kontrak proyek kita. Dan di sini kita bisa lihat ada kategori uh, dari manajemen sampai dengan field work, worker ya di situ. Jadi memang sebagian besar karyawan kita yang bekerja di lapangan itu uh, bisa lebih dari 50 persen ya. Jadi dengan edukasi dari uh, kebanyakan untuk di field itu adalah kebanyakan dari uh, lulusan dari technical college atau STM, uh, sebagian SMA dan untuk supervisor ada juga yang diploma dan bachelor ya di sana. Uh, itu adalah gambaran uh, karyawan kita di sini. Uh, selanjutnya mungkin bisa dilanjutkan oleh Pak Kris untuk membawakan materi selanjutnya. Thanks, Sophie. So I yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction on the business. So uh, when Ibu Nur became involved with our business as a consultant, as a HR consultant, um, this is one of the diagrams. Uh, that we worked with at the time, which I believe, Ibu, if I remember right, was from B.F. Skinner, sort of reinforcement concepts of, of uh, behaviour that we we're looking for. And so uh, we took this as a framework and started on the, uh, the... One of the first jobs we really started with was developing job descriptions. Prior to this, we had... Um, we didn't have job descriptions for every position. Uh, we had some loose descriptions, but they were different, you know, from job to job. So uh, Ibn Nora set about uh, working with our HR team, with Oven and Sophie, to make it a very inclusive process. So the idea was is the person who best knows what involves what's involved in doing their job is the person doing the job. So uh, we started a, a very intensive communication process where uh, we got input, as we say there, from the field workers, like from a technician, you know, what is involved in their job. And once they developed, and we, we developed a framework of how they would describe the job. We've got an example that we'll show you in a minute. And um, and then we we then took that to their supervisor, and their supervisor then gave input as well to make sure that it was accurate. And then that was moved up the line, and it was reviewed by the managers, and ultimately by 
the operations manager for the business and uh, together with myself, we reviewed those positions. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at the higher levels of review, we were really looking for consistency across, across all of the descriptions so that, you know, um, in our business, for example, it's a little bit like the army where you have, you know, you have the helpers, uh, you have above that in the field, you have like a tradesman who knows how to do his job, an expert at his job. And then above that, the first level of management is called a leading hand. He looks after maybe three people, a little bit like a corporal in the army. Above that is a foreman who looks after something like nine people, and he's like a sergeant in the army. And then above him is the supervisor, which is like a lieutenant or a captain, somebody like that, who's looking after multiple foremen and leading hands. So um, we wanted to make sure that everything flowed through correctly. And then this, this job description then became the foundation that we use for performance appraisal. So um, by determining like this is what a person does when we're doing a performance appraisal, uh, depending on what, what kind of performance appraisal we're doing, we'd be looking at, well, are you meeting the requirements of the job? Um, and there was, this was a, a long process. It took a lot longer than what we thought but it was worth it. Um, we, in all, we had 86 positions, unique positions within the business that each needed their own job description. Um, and all this review had to be done by people outside of their normal work hours because they had a normal job to do. And we're, we're not a, a government agency. We don't have people just dedicated to making job descriptions. So, you know, uh, the foreman and supervisors at the end of a long day they would then sit down and, and have to do this, which of course is not easy, right? And you're very tired and then to have to go and do all this as well. Um, and then when we started working on the performance appraisal system, we realized that we needed more guidance on what is good performance and what is not good performance. Um, so then we then modified the, uh, the job description to include, okay, this is a script, this is what bad performance looks like. This is what good performance looks like. Uh, let me just see if I can uh, open up that. I don't know if you... An example here of a job description. Are people seeing that job description? Uh, not yet, blank. Mm -hmm. No, let me. Not yet. Okay. Why are they still dark? Let me just check. I'll just stop sharing for a second. Go to the other document. And let me share the screen now. If you can see that now. Yes. yes. So this is an example that we did of a, what's called the leading hand, which I, the description I described before was someone like a corporal. So this person looks after three or four individuals. He's the first level of management in the business, the first level of leadership in our business. So we do a description like this, a job summary, where we're talking about that their job is to initiate work activities, um, for different technical roles. They supervise, they coordinate their team, they do reporting, and they work themselves. And then we'd go through a description of each, each of their duties that they have to do. So in this case here, completion of the works in accordance with their instructions from their boss, the foreman or supervisor. How they have to allocate work effectively to subordinates. Um, they have to lay out their expectations when they do it and so on. Develop... Uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures, and work method statements for safe work. And you see on the right-hand side, that's where we talked about, okay, what does someone who is doing above standard behaviour, what does it look like? So it says there at the outset, they'll clearly state the expectations and procedures to be followed. They constantly check on the workers, how they're performing. They develop more efficient procedures. They look at how we do things and see how can they do it better. Um, and that they distribute the work optimally so they find the best capabilities and they give it to the right people. And then we talk about what, is, what does below standard look like? Well, 
they take back the responsibilities and just say, well, I'll just do it all myself, you know, because I need to get it done, right? Or, you know, they deviate from the standard operating procedure, right? Or the workers are confused about what to do. So that's an example there of a, of a job description. It lays out their duties. You see it's quite, quite involved. And then at this part here, the job dimension, uh, in developing the salary system, and we'll talk about that later, we'd use the Hayes job evaluation uh, method. So each job is also broken down into the seven dimension in accordance with that theory. Like for example, the first one there being the specific or technical knowledge required you know, for the position. You can also see it's done in two languages. Um, that also made everything twice as long as well. So quite a lot of work went into this, identifying risks, safety risks, what their authority was, and then at the end here, talking about the qualifications needed for the position. So this position, a high school graduation is fine, at least two years' experience as a tradesman doing the work themselves, able to read drawings and so on. And that's it. That was an example there of a, of a job description. Back to Sharon Michael. So um, this became the foundation of all the other of our initiatives that we we're doing in HR. So it was a, a very key role and worth the time to be put into it, worth the investment, uh, in my view. That's just an example there. Then on the other element was talking about leadership development. Um, we we're very lucky to have uh, Ibn Nur involved with us, and she gave us fresh insights very good having somebody from outside the organisation to look in and give us insights that we would not necessarily have thought of because typically we're operating in a framework that's based on 30 years of doing things a certain way. So it was very good to have an outsider come in and have us question why we do things. Um, and so, for example, as part of that discussion with her and Irvin and uh, Ibu Sufi, you know, we talked about setting up a, a communication channel so that all employees could communicate directly to HR using WhatsApp. Um, uh, Ibu Noor also initiated a, a process where we would do counselling for our, our leadership team. Um, and from that grew this, uh, the coaching that we set up uh, some group discussions as well as one-on-one -on -one discussions where we, I, um, we were really coaching those leaders, hearing about their concerns um, and identifying roadblocks, identifying obstacles that we could help them get over um, and identifying problems we had in our systems and our, in our business where we might have to look at. And so we had good feedback coming back and, and we never really had that feedback loop established before. So um, it, was a, it was a good step forward, I feel, for business and something we're still working on all the time is to improve that communication and improve our leadership. The next stage in the diagram here focuses on response, um, work behaviour and, and performance appraisals. So having established the job description, we then set up different uh, performance appraisals because we felt that one performance appraisal was not Enough. And Sophie, please jump in at any time if there's anything you want to add to anything I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ibu Nord Juga, right? If you want to uh, contribute anything, please go ahead. Magma. So with this one here, we, we felt that a lot of our workers, you saw the education levels before that Sophie uh, displayed. A lot of our workers didn't have sophisticated education levels. They hadn't gone to university and so on. So, you know, things like... Um, Literacy becomes an issue and and just we want to reduce the complexity of, of things to make sure they get accepted and rolled out and, and implemented easier. So we set up a system for our field workers, which was only based on uh, four criteria. Uh, it was based upon the, so the supervisor would review their workers on the basis of uh, did they perform the work on time? Did they do good quality work? Did they do safe work? and their attitude throughout the process. So it's only four criteria, and it made it simple. And uh, we established that system for the field workers. For the supervisors, 
Well, they had about 13 uh, excuse criteria. Me. Excuse me, but unless you, I think you have the next, the example. Yeah, this one. Yep, that's an example there of the system we used for the field workers. Now, this is this is a soft copy of the book that was printed um, because we also had issues with technology. Because, as uh, Sophie had said before, Ibu Nur, we do operate in remote locations where we do our projects. So often there's not good Wi-Fi. There's not good 3G signals. Sometimes there's no 3G signals, right? So we had to have backup systems where people would have a, a, a pocketbook and the supervisor could pull the pocketbook out, write down the information and sign it and have the employee sign it, right? And, for example, this is one, one example of, of cultural differences where when we spoke to the supervisors the first time, they said, no, 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 we don't want the employee to sign it. We want this to be secret. And we said, well, you're not going to change someone's behavior if you're not giving them the feedback that they're not performing or they're performing well or they're not performing, you know. Um, and so that was a negotiation we had with the supervisors so that, um, you know, they agreed in the end that they, that made sense and they had to really be a bit more courageous with this and get the employee to sign it if they've done something wrong. Uh, of course, positive feedback, it's easy for the employees to sign that, right? But uh, for negatives, um, that, was a, that was a cultural issue that we, we came up against. Then for the supervisors, we had about 13 or 14 criteria. So the same four that was in the field worker and then like another 10 or so. So additional criteria, I don't know if you can read some of that, but for example, number four there is the ability to read a drawing, a technical drawing. Because very often the way we, are, we know what to do on a project is we have a drawing that's done by an engineer and that says we should install the piping, for example, like so, like the drawing. So they have to follow the drawing. If they install something different from the drawing, the customer will make us redo it again at our cost, which is more expensive. So the supervisor has to follow the drawing so then he can give instructions to his employees, to his uh, subordinates. Uh, another one there is number seven, estimating the amount of work to be done and what resources you need. So the, the bar for supervisors was considerably higher than for our workers. There was more criteria and we expected more from them. And we could use this also to identify development needs if, if they weren't able to do some of these things. Then for all other non-management positions, it was a little bit more complicated because people in these different positions do quite different things. You know, a HR officer would be assessed on this form, but so would an accounting clerk, as would the receptionist or a secretary or an engineer doing estimating, for example. So we developed a more flexible system for the office staff and admin people and engineers where it was based upon their job description. So we looked at their job description. What are their activities? So it was, it was a custom form that was filled out. That's why this is shown blank. And then we would weight each of those activities according to how important it was and how much effort work was involved. And then the the manager would assess them whether they're above the standard, if they meet the standard or below the standard, and it would calculate a score for them. This was uh, quite, quite a popular system and it um, received good uptake, good support, good implementation from our employees. And then for managers, we had a different system again. So at the high level managers, typically people reporting to me or to the operations manager, we then noted uh, the initiatives that was important uh, for those managers to achieve in the next 12 months, because these tended to be longer term projects, something that couldn't be assessed on a daily or a monthly basis. So for example, point number three there, updates department procedures and work instruction procedures. This is for our QA, QC and, and, and safety manager, right, to update our procedures. So he'd have mini deadlines, mini KPIs in this with specific dates, 
And that also has a weighting of how much that initiative was worth versus some of the other initiatives. So this, this was a more complicated, more high-level assessment, and the goal was to sit down with these managers once a month, go through these initiatives, and have a discussion about, um, you know, what, what their issues were generally and also to work through the KPIs. So we had issues in doing this. As I said before, there were some technological issues um, and also just, just uh, hesitance, hesitancy, just uh, resistance to change because now this involved asking people to do more work um, each month. People were resistant. So a lot of managers complained they were too busy to do it. So, you know, that, uh, that required consistent pressure to keep, to keep pushing this ahead. So that was the performance appraisal system. In addition, we rolled out uh, a 360 degree review process so that uh, the employee would review their subordinates, their manager, their peers and themselves. The core competency was based upon seven values that we had agreed upon in the business was the key values for our business. Um, and whereas the performance appraisal was typically used to measure more hard skills or, you know, performance, you know, observable behaviour, this was more about soft skills, looking at um, how the how the the person performs their job rather than what they do. And this was used to determine um, who should be promoted, you know, where there were development needs within people. We could focus on those soft skills. The, the issue was, though, these are more complex concepts, you know, the idea of courage or integrity, you know. Um, so... We had to do more socialization on this and explain it to people. Um, and of course, because this was 360 degree, it increased the burden on people at every level of the organization, including the people out in the field. Now they had an admin job to do, which was to go online and review typically seven people, uh, some peers, if they're at the lower levels, their peers and their, their bosses. Um, people in the middle level would be going, going up and down in each direction. So um, that also creates its own opposition, its own difficulty in doing that. We also listened after a period of time. We saw that there was issues, and then we simplified the language for the core competency in 2021. And so, for example, here we're talking, at, this is an example of one of the values, which is the value of courage, which is one of our seven values. And you can see there, there's two questions. Typically, there was about two questions for each of the values. And uh, we're asking for the first one, you know, are they willing to take risks like that and do the right thing, even though it's difficult, which to us is really the definition of courage, right? Um, even if something is difficult, you know, will you do the right thing? And, and what's, their, what's their observable behaviour? So do they often do that? Do they rarely do that? Do they always do that? And the second point they're talking about um, bringing problems to our attention. That's, that's, and th this is also something which is a cultural difference, right? In fact, not just Indonesia, in many cultures, it's very hard to bring problems to the manager, especially if the manager has made the mistake. Uh, there's a lot of power difference. Um, it's quite difficult to, to have those discussions um, and to, to say that you've made a mistake, that you've messed up, you've done something wrong, because the way our culture is in the business, we want to know that as soon as possible. The sooner we know something has gone wrong, the sooner we can respond and try and fix it. So these are important uh, values to us and, and therefore it was an important thing for us to assess, especially for promotions to say is someone ready to step up and become a manager they need to have these core competencies and we can work on development based on uh, what comes back on this so the final stage here talking about reinforcement through rewards salary benefits and punishments 
we um, we set up something which I, I believe is quite uh, quite revolutionary, uh, which was to uh, create a profit share in the business for every employee. So every employee, we, we took a share of the profits and then distributed that to every employee in the business. Um, and uh, that allocation was based upon uh, was was factored with a factor was applied to determine each employee's share based on their performance of how they'd gone on on the previous uh, system, and also based upon their uh, their uh, importance in the organisation, their, their level in the organisation, which was determined by uh, what's called a job score, which we'll get into next. Uh, we also set up the performance allowance. So based on the performance appraisal system, people who received in a month above standard performance received an extra allowance in their pay, an extra, extra money in their salary just for that month, a special allowance. Uh, depending on, on how well they had done, it could be above standard, it could be a high allowance, it could be an outstanding allowance. And... Uh, the key the key element here was also to communicate that through the organization because um, you know we learned you know, through Ibn Nur and, and you know, what we know of HR theory that recognition is a powerful motivator for people also a powerful reward mechanism so by you know announcing in a monthly email these are the people who will receive the performance allowance this month we believe that also helped to motivate and encourage good performance in addition, there was a special profit share for the profit, uh, project managers and division managers who contribute a lot to the profitability on projects. We had a sales commission for salespeople. And the final point there, the acting position, we created an acting allowance so that if we wanted to try somebody in a new promotion, rather than promote them and then find, for example, that maybe they weren't suitable, we created an acting position with an acting position allowance, which gave them almost the same money that they would have if they had the real position, but it was for six months, and at the end of six months, they were assessed. And if we felt that they weren't really ready for that new position, they would lose the allowance and go back to their old salary. If they were, they'd get a little bit more and move up to the permanent position. So the salary system was... I would say our second biggest initiative after the job descriptions. Um, it involved a lot of work, 86 different positions, unique positions in the business. As it says there, and I mentioned before, we use the Hayes job evaluation system to determine a job score for every unique position in the business. Then we assessed each employee against their job description to say what percentage of that job were they were they achieving? What were they able to do of that job? And typically, people range between 75% and 100% of what they're able to do with the job. We also built education into the salary system so that if people had better education, as long as it was suitable for a job, those people would receive additional uh, salary. So, you know, it wouldn't matter if, a, if someone like a, a tradesman had a PhD right, because it's not really going to impact on their job. But for other positions, more senior positions, having a degree, having a master's degree, um, created additional earnings for that employee. And then experience. We, we really started working on this system because we had feedback from our employees that some of our employees who had worked in the business a long time were paid about the same as the new employees that were coming on, and that was causing satisfaction. So we built a system into the salary whereby we would, we would account for the person's experience and their years of working to increase their salary that way. So all of that was combined together and weighted to arrive at what's called an OSS, an overall salary score. So each individual had their own unique points, which was their OSS. And then we applied those points by an amount of rupiah, which was approximately the same for everybody. So the goal, the end goal, when we started this, um, if you know 
the, the seven habits of highly effective people, beginning with the end in mind, uh, you know, habit number five, is that we wanted to um, we wanted the employees to be able to calculate their own salary and work out why is my salary like this and why is the guy that I work with, why is his more or less? So we wanted employees to have a very transparent system where they could work out the points, multiply by the, the repair, and that's my salary. And uh, we more or less achieved that. You know, it, it did. There was issues, again, um, literacy, numeracy issues. It's <laughs> Um, we had some rounding errors the first time, which which caused people to be confused about why the numbers didn't add up. We, we fixed that. And we also had issues where because we'd done this new system, there were some people paid under the old legacy salary system, which was paid too much according to the new system. So we had we had one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. We uh, addressed their concerns. We explained what was happening because they could see that other people were getting salary increases under the new system whereas they, they got no salary increase. We did not decrease salaries, but they didn't get a salary increase. And we explained that's because your old salary indicates you're paid, overpaid for the position according to our new system. And any time you make a change like this, you've always got people who are left out like that, the change, and there's nothing you can really do about it apart from helping their development so they can get to a position where they could get a salary increase. Um, and sort through maybe they can just do horizontal movements and so on and more challenging work. The last thing we introduced was a certification allowance. So if people had certificates or qualifications, they would receive additional um, allowances every day. So for the, the lowest level of that is something like a SIM license. Uh, a supervisor with a SIM license to us is more valuable than a supervisor without one because then he needs someone else to drive him around. So we're willing to pay that supervisor to go and get his SIM and pay for him to use that license. A little bit of money. Um, more complicated uh, issues, things like the Ahli Kartiga for our safety people. If they were to achieve that through doing you know, uh, a course and then they pass the tests and achieve that, we give them uh, uh, more allowance for that. And the customers re uh, recognize that and value that also. So this is our second last slide. This is us talking here about uh, our plans going forward. So uh, we're looking at the moment to complete our talent map of the organisation and really identify who are the, the key top talent and where we can develop people to move them up in this matrix. Um, Ibu Noura is working with us at the moment. We've done psychological tests, we've done IQ tests uh, to identify potential, uh, excuse me, as well as the systems we've put in place to identify potential. And finally, we thought it wouldn't, it wouldn't be right if we didn't talk about COVID because COVID's uh, in a business like ours, COVID has had a massive impact because one of the first things companies stopped doing during COVID was to start building new projects and spending more money. As the world entered a very uncertain time, not many people wanted to build a new factory to make things that may not be needed if the economy is turning down and so on. So a lot of our business uh, was affected. In addition, like everybody else, like yourselves, um, our people started working from home and so we needed to create new policies from a HR perspective to deal with that. Um, we went through different occupancy rates of the office. We put in place salary reductions because financially we were having tough times. We had to terminate the staff. Um, and those salary reductions, those terminations affect morale. Uh, we were a very tight group of people have worked together for a long time and it's very hard to let these people go and to, to terminate them or to have uh, pay cuts in effect. So that's that's had its toll on HR and even HR also has, has been reduced in size. Um, so that's made everything more of a challenge as well to keep the initiatives going and certainly difficult to launch, launch new initiatives. Um, but we feel now uh, hopefully, that the effects of COVID are, are more or less coming to an end 
and we're starting to see now projects starting again, which is very positive for our business. So uh, that ends our formal presentation there. Sophie, was there anything you wanted to add at this point? I think it's enough, I think. Okay. Uh, Ibu Indra, do you want to take back the screen here? Okay, Chris, thank you very much. I'm experiencing become your uh, employee. So <laughs> explain your yeah, uh, Busulfi explaining about vision and mission, and then you just I just uh, enjoy your storytelling. Just oh, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> and then you also um, deliver lots of practices in uh, ODGs, and I think uh, my student has already have their own questions uh, for you. So I would Thanks. like to open a question and answer to. You all participant in this uh, Zoom, you are going to deliver your questions. Just uh, open your mic or uh, chat in the chat uh, box. So please, there are so many issues, I think, uh, when uh, Chris develop a group to create a job description in the beginning of this company in uh, 25 years ago, how it was. And uh, now they are experiencing uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, do you also use hybrid working, Chris? We have done. Uh, back in March last year, when, when it first struck, we moved everybody to working at home. Oh, um, okay. In, in the head office. Of course, the people in the field we can't, they can't do their job at home. <laughs> These are Tukang, Tukang Listric or Tukang Kai yeah. or whatever. They're installing pipes and electricity. They can't do that from home. So they had to keep working. Yeah, so, but you protect uh, them much. You protect that's them That's right. Much. So we had new protocols in place which okay. reduced productivity and made it more difficult but kept our people safe. And you know, one thing we've learned about COVID, of course, is that it's, it's relatively hard to transmit outdoors. So mm -hmm. that also made it um, actually quite a healthy environment for those employees to be working as well. Okay, good. so teman-teman uh, sekalian silahkan. Kalau memang harus menggunakan bahasa Indonesia silahkan bagi uh, international undergraduate program, please deliver your uh, questions in English. Uh, mungkin bisa raise hand atau menuliskan nama di chatting. Silahkan. Oke, okay, boleh pakai bahasa Indonesia untuk mahasiswa reguler, silahkan nanti kita coba uh, sampaikan ke Chris dalam bahasa Inggris. Atau Bapak Ibu yang dari Oh ya, dari mitra dari uh, luar uh, UGM silahkan atau dari uh, luar kelas psikologi organisasi silahkan. Sangat banyak tadi yang disampaikan oleh Chris terkait dengan visi misinya dan juga tadi bagaimana membangun performance appraisal, kemudian reward system, salary system dan misinya sangat mulia since the beginning mereka ingin uh, engage dengan community sehingga uh, concern terhadap community, kesejahteraan komunitas juga menjadi bagian dari uh, keberadaan organisasi ini. Mungkin ini sangat menarik bagi teman-teman sekalian. Kemudian juga terkait dengan uh, bagaimana memotivasi Uh, karyawan, how to improve uh, their motivations at work, bagaimana memilih uh, sistem yang pas untuk uh, konteks Indonesia, di mana ya kita tahu sendiri, tadi Chris juga mention about uh, power distance, our national culture, power distance as well as feminist country, we like, uh, we, we are, uh, kita lebih senang hidup di dalam uh, situasi yang harmonis sehingga menghindari konflik dan sebagainya. Jadi banyak sekali yang dijelaskan uh, oleh Chris dan mudah-mudahan uh, bisa membawa semacam ke rasa ingin tahu untuk tahu lebih jauh lagi terkait dengan kehidupan uh, praktek dan kebijakan di organisasi. Silakan. This is also cultural, I think. People are hesitant to ask questions. Yes. <laughs> Oke. Okay. Raisa, please open your mic and uh -oh. open your video. Bahasa Indonesia oke okay, juga Raisa. Pak Kris ngerti kok. Hmm. 
Okay, it's okay. I will. I will ask in English. Uh, okay, so my question is: uh, I would like to know, uh, has there been a mental health awareness in this company, and how does the mental health or productivity uh, condition uh, in this uh, COVID nineteen era? Okay, so that's my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Raisa. Thanks, Raisa. Um, we we haven't had a specific mental health policy. Uh, as part of the counselling that we've done, we've opened up uh, HR to offer some counselling service to employees who, for example, may want to bring up uh, confidential issues and discuss with HR. They can bring it up, um, or if they're struggling for whatever in every way with work. Um, they can bring that up to to HR, and HRs uh, made themselves available to do that kind of counselling. Um, but uh, we haven't had we haven't had that sort of mental health policy put in place. That's a good point. But is there any incident of that, Chris? In Uh, since I've been president director since 2017, I can't recall. It was Sophie. Has there been incidents of mental health issues? Mm, um, I think there is no mental issue since that. I don't okay. think so. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Um, The, the only the only time I, I know that's become apparent is when we had one of our mm. expatriate managers. He had a, a breakdown that was about what ten years ago, mm. um, and we helped him get medical treatment and we helped him get back to Australia um, mm. to be with his family and, and with his regular doctor and things like that. Mm. Um, we haven't had those sort of issues with our national workforce so much. Okay, so. Uh, can I say that uh, you already provide a good leadership? Then, so would you? Don't you mind uh, share to us about your uh, style of leadership to run this organization? Um, well, I, I don't know if that's that's the reason why there's been no mental health issues, but <laughs> yeah, because, but of, <laughs> because of the leader. So we trust to the leader, and then uh, the leader make us comfort, and uh, okay. we can yeah <laughs> consult to him every time, every uh, day, every minutes, even every second. <laughs> but we, my my own personal leadership style is I've tried to be more inclusive, and I I do believe that a leader has to listen. Um, and so one of the first things I did as as when I took over the position in May 2017 was to call in my my managers and my key staff and we had a SWOT analysis to talk about well, what what do they perceive as the weaknesses of the business. Um, and I do remember before I became the, only a few weeks before I became the leader, I had asked my IT manager at the time, um, asked him, well, what do you think we should be doing in the business? His comment was, there's no point in saying because nobody listens, right? <laughs> And that was like an alarm going off of, oh, okay, our culture is not good, right? If that's the case, if the employees feel like there's no point in criticizing or bringing up something if, if nobody listens, Um, and in fact, it was it was him in that discussion said that he said would would we be open to bringing in an outsider who would be more receptive and perhaps allow us to hold up a mirror and look at ourselves more clearly, you know? And it was actually from Chayo, from my IT manager, that really initiated bringing in Ibu Noor into the business um, of find, looking out for a HR consultant. And then I said, well, no, I'll, I want to find someone, and I want to. I want to encourage that dialogue so that people do feel comfortable to talk because if there's lots of things that are bad and nobody wants mm -hmm. to talk about it, mm -hmm. that's not good for the business. You know, our future is not, not good if people feel they can't bring problems to the leaders in the business. Yeah, but, so, yeah. but it's common in Indonesia, Chris. I, not just Indonesia. I think in many parts of the world. In it's, many, it's, okay. People, 
don't like to have confrontation, right? Yeah. They don't, they don't want to say, boss, uh, you know, the way you're doing that is making everyone upset and you don't notice, you know. Yeah. <laughs> People don't want to say that and it's, it takes courage to say it. Mm-hmm. But it's good when you have that conversation. Mm-hmm. It's almost always a good thing. Um, now, not all bosses want to hear that. I, I remember I had a, not, he wasn't my boss, but he was the head of Asia for Tyco. And he had a policy. He had a policy of don't bring me bad news, right? He said, don't come to me with bad news, right? <laughs> and to me, that's the absolute craziest thing a manager can say. All you're going to do is you're going to push the problems under the carpet. You're going to have things happening which people don't want to tell you about, right? Um, we've tried to create the opposite culture of please bring me bad news, right? If there's bad news, please tell me because only by knowing that something's wrong that we can start trying to fix it. So that's, if I was to think of like sort of one one aspect that, that categorizes my leadership, I'd like to think, I would hope that it's, it's listening and creating a more inclusive culture where people feel they can talk and, and bring up problems, hopefully. Okay. So listening then, the key, the key word of the successful. Well, for me, I, I think everyone's different. You know, different people yeah. have different approaches. It's, it's my approach. Um, other people can succeed doing other ways, you know, but for me, that's my approach. Okay. Um, okay. Based on your ex- uh, okay. Uh, Chris, based on your experience, have you ever had uh, situations like, uh, you know, uh, so many resistance everywhere and then uh, how did you deal with uh, the resistance from this uh, people, from Indonesian people, uh, which is uh, we are different with the Western culture. Western culture more more open, more uh, direct, and when they communicate something, they they more uh, in a in a uh, low contact compared of us in a high contact. So, how did you uh, manage uh, this kind of situations? Well, um, there's been a few times in the last four years where, especially during COVID, where things have been difficult. Um, so, for example, I remember when we uh, announced that we were going to be doing a pay cut. And, of course, nobody likes that. Nobody wants to have a pay cut. Um, and it hurts everybody. Um, so, you know, but at that meeting, I, we, we really overcame that resistance, overcame that opposition, really by being very open and honest with the employees. Um, I felt at that time, there's no point in trying to sugarcoat to make things sound better than they are. It was, and I think the employees appreciated being spoken to as adults and told the bad news that that the business was in a very hard way. The projects were shutting down because of COVID and we had to do these pay cuts and we had to do this twice. First at 22.5% and then it was increased to a 38% pay cut. And that's that's a huge amount for someone to lose out of their salary, almost 40% from their salary every month. When we consider that most people struggle with the salary they have, right? They, they manage to pay the bills, but they're not really saving a lot. And then this had to happen. So a very difficult time and really the only t- way to do it, like I said, was through communication and being open and honest. Mm-hmm. So then it's work. Well, I mean, pe- people are still not happy, but they accepted it. And I was very, I felt very privileged that our employees supported that and got behind it and were mm-hmm. willing to accept it. Uh, everybody, unilaterally, right? Yeah. Um, so it felt very good team cohesion. We felt like a very close team. Uh, I, I took a, a pay cut as well. Everyone took mm-hmm. a pay mm-hmm. cut. So mm-hmm. we're all in this essentially the same situation. Um, okay. We appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, we've got that point, uh, Chris. Uh, I think uh, this is common in our organization when uh, there is a bad news, uh, the leader just keep it behind them without clarifying to uh, or informing to the employee and it will make condition worse and worse and worse. But uh, you have uh, your own experience that you just 
just say frankly speaking to them about the conditions and it works to make them uh, more engaged with uh, this organization that's that's good lesson learned for, for uh, from Chris and I think there is uh, questions from Todo Todo are you going to deliver your questions please open your mic um, thank you Bindra and thank you Mr Chris uh, I want to ask more about uh, the, your strategy about COVID mm -hmm. and most and most of your employees blue collar right so, most of yes they're working out in the field like took on the street people yeah, like yeah. that so uh i think they were that's uh, more difficult to manage them to adapt uh other than uh, the white color so how you manage the blue color to adapt with COVID? um because mostly their job is clerical and did you change the job description uh, Please elaborate more about your strategy. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, so it was different. Our approach to the blue collar workers, to our field workers, the Orang Yang Kutu di Lapangan, right, um, was different because, um, you know, they, they have different risks. And like I said before, being outside, now we didn't know that at the beginning of COVID. We didn't know that people outside are less likely to transmit it. So we came up with very strict health protocols. So we, we didn't change the job descriptions because their job was still the same. Um, however, in, in our industry, there is something called a job safety analysis. And the idea is every morning when we gather, you know, the, the, imagine, imagine 100 men arriving at a work site, a construction site, they arrive in the morning, they get their tools and then they go and meet with their supervisor. And this is you know, a group of maybe 10 men and they stand around in a circle around the supervisor and the supervisor sits down with them and say, or stands up with them and says, okay, this is the jobs we're doing today. And then as part of that, he'll say, okay, what are the risks? What are the dangers in doing these jobs? This is a key part of our safety uh, culture. So what are the risks? What could go wrong? You know, if you're on a ladder, you could fall off the ladder. How, so what are you going to do to make sure the ladder doesn't fall off or the ladder, ladder could tip over? So you have to have a guy at the bottom holding the ladder to keep it secure so you're safe at the top, things like that. So they'll have that discussion. So COVID became a new item that was introduced to that morning discussion. So Sophie produced a, a, a together with our safety manager, produced a new health protocol and we had a lot of input from our managers as well about which protocols to follow. We were looking at the Indonesian government. We we're looking at the CDC about the different uh, health protocols. We came up with our own health protocols and our own rules and, and regulations and, and practices. What would happen if someone had sick? We had a whole flow chart of what happens if someone has symptoms and so on and what we do and who, what gets shut down and what keeps going. So that new protocol then became a part of our work. So then, like we're saying, every morning when the supervisors are there, they would also go through the COVID protocol. He would check to make sure everyone's got masks on. You know, um, We have availability of things like disinfectant and so on, all those things that were part of the protocol. Um, and they were carried out uh, every morning. So in that way, the blue collars sort of had more reinforcement of the safety protocols than the white collar workers because the white collar workers sitting in, a, uh, in an office like me, so they don't have that daily safety meeting because there's not really any dangers in the office. We don't worry about it. But so we would communicate to the white collar workers. They'd, they'd receive an email. It's got the protocol on it. We have it up on the wall in the office um, and as managers, we had to reinforce the protocol. You know, I would go around and if somebody, and I encouraged people as well to say, look, even if your boss is not wearing a mask, you can say to your boss, uh, but can you please put your mask on, right? And I said, if it's me, you've got to tell me if I'm not wearing my mask properly, you've got to say something, you know, we're all protecting each other. So don't, again, don't feel there's a power distance where you can't say to me, but, you know, uh, you should be wearing a mask, you know. Um, you know, in, in a polite way, you, you got to say it. So, 
So part of the, the new protocols was also reinforcing it. So going around and saying to people, hey, you've got your mask under your chin. You know, that's not the way it's supposed to work. You know, just with a smile and or just point at this. Yeah, okay, sorry, sorry, but, you know, let's put it on. So we reinforced it in different ways in the office versus the, the white collar versus the blue collar. Uh, different challenges, but in both ways, it became a new part of our culture, you know, a new part of our safety system. Okay, uh, Chris, uh, there is another question from Igde Agus Abdi Wirajaya. Can you see if he's following us now uh, through uh, YouTube? So I would like to uh, uh, read uh, his questions. As the company through so many changes in policy and system, how do you keep the employee committed to it and ensure the new policy and system are followed throughout by the employees? Oh, that is a very good question. <laughs> you could call that the million dollar question. That's the hard thing, right? It's it's relatively easy to come up with a policy, right? It's relatively easy to come up with a set of rules. Uh, the hardest thing always is implementing it and, um, you know, a, a achieving sustainable change in an organisation, very hard. So typically what we would do if it was a major announcement that was, say, going to affect, uh, affect people in a significant way, for example, something like the performance appraisal and the performance allowances, we would hold off announcing the performance appraisal until we had the performance allowance also finalised so that we're presenting someone a more complete system. And also connected in that is that reward structure which really is there to reinforce the behaviour we're trying to get, right? We're trying to achieve. So um, a big part of this, of any kind of implementation, is socialisation. And that's really where, you know, someone like, like me as a Westerner has to adapt to the Indonesian culture, right? Things have to be socialised more. And it's I, I fully support socialisation. <laughs> it's a great idea, Right of going out, rolling out the program and, and explaining it to people in small groups, big groups. Um, you know, it'd be very common we would have like a someone like me might come out and give an overview of, a, of the new performance appraisal system. Um, and, they, and every employee can ask me questions about it or ask Sufi. And then typically we'd have breakaway sessions where smaller groups could then ask uh, Oven or could ask Sufi different um, so, yeah, and, and it wasn't, you can't just do it once. It needs, it needs revisiting again and re, you know, it takes a lot of energy to make a change happen in an organization because as you've no doubt learned, you know, everyone's more or less resistant to change. Um, everyone's more or less happy with the way things are going. And, uh, especially if you're going to create work for somebody, and they're going to have to do something new, something extra. Um, there's a lot of pushback to that, a lot of change. So we try to connect it with, well, it's worth doing because you can get these performance appraisal, uh, performance allowances. You know, you can, it's worth doing because there is a profit share that's going to come from this. And we also built into, for example, the performance appraisal criteria for supervisors who are, who are say, assessing all the workers, one of their criteria is their ability to follow through on uh, company initiatives, their willingness, their effectiveness at, at following through on company initiatives. So they were being assessed on their assessing as well. Um, so if they were below standard, that would affect their performance. So we, wherever possible, we tried to build those loops into the system, reward loops and punishment loops into the system to encourage that change of behaviour because it really is not easy at all. And even when I talk about these things and we did this and we did that, you know, if I'm real with you, I can say, well, 80% of the employees in the company are doing it. 20% are hard and stuck and are really not going to follow these sort of initiatives. Um, and they have to be dragged into it and it, it's a lot of opposition. Um, 
And so, you know, you count on you count on the leaders in the group um, supporting it, and in, and, the, and them encouraging other people. It can't the energy can't just come from me and Salty and Nord and Oven. You know, the leaders have to buy into it, and they have to then push their own people to do it. So, not easy at all. And we've had some initiatives fail because. Um, the leaders, the other leaders, just did not support it. They were too busy. They were making money. They were too busy, and they said, "Look, you're distracting me from my main job, you know." And I, I want to focus on the main job. And so, uh, you know, in some ways, we had to let some of those people just not follow the system, and the others did. The people who did follow the system, well, they got the allowances. The people who didn't follow the system didn't get the extra money. And we were hoping then. That if the if we can't persuade the leaders to do it, that there's a ground swell from the bottom up of people saying, "Hey, I want allowances. I want you to be assessing." Um, but we're still waiting for that. <laughs> so not easy, not easy at all. It's the hardest thing in okay. everything we're doing is that implementation, that that uh, acceptance. You know? <laughs> okay, Bu E, you want to add something? Tadi mau menambahkan. Enggak sih. Jadi kalau sistem itu benar ya sistem di udik ya udah jadi semuanya cuma apa untuk me, ya udah jalan sih tapi enggak 100% itu yang disampaikan oleh Pak Kris tadi. Jadi ya masih aja tersendat-sendat seperti kompetensi inti itu yang isi juga berapa persen ya Vin? Kita udah dorong-dorong isi minta kita undang tapi ya Sampai sekarang belum 100% ya. Sus. Memang kendala seperti itu memungkinkan sekali. Ayo bagaimana ini para mahasiswa? Oh, ada yang nanya? Hey, ayo raise hand. Oke, okay. Teresa. <laughs> ah, itu dia tuh. I love Teresa. Habis Teresa terus Alia Naura. Nah, lumayan nih udah. Udah pada nongol. Silahkan Bu Indah. Okay, Mr. Evan, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was really nice to see how the theory we study in class actually use in this organizational field. Okay, so my question is related to the example system for supervisor and superintendents. Uh, for example, in question eight, I actually screenshotted your slide before. Uh, okay. The form is asking about uh, the supervisor's knowledge. Uh, So I was wondering why is the system using a yes or no choice uh, in Indonesian is menguasai or tidak menguasai begitu instead of using uh, for example a numerical uh, scale from 1 to 10 to further assess the extent of the supervisor's knowledge okay that's it for my question sir thank you very much Bunur, you want to respond to this or you got a, an answer for this <laughs> Ini scalingnya, kenapa? Uh, jadi scalingnya ya, kok bisa? Cuma ya tidak. Ada, apa tadi pertanyaannya? Why don't we have a numerical scale? Kenapa ya dan tidak? Kenapa nggak rating scale? Yeah, itemnya, satu, itemnya, untuk... itemnya. Uh, please you read it again, Mar. Teresa. Uh, Oke, okay. untuk itemnya itu, uh, apakah supervisor uh, mengenai pengetahuan di uh, lapangan kalau tidak salah Bu mengetahui pengetahuan di lapangan itu supervisor menguasai atau tidak menguasai begitu. Oh, oh ya kita memang ini dasarnya memang ya yang menguasai apa tidak gitu. Kalau ada yang nggak tahu berarti udah dianggap nggak menguasai. Tapi kalau pakai pakai rating 1 2 3 4 5 misalnya itu nanti saya takutnya bias. Kita kita takutnya bias. Uh, di sini nulis 4, di situ nulis 3 pada Sebetulnya yang empat itu lebih kurang karena beda ini ya beda rater ya pertimbangannya cuma itu sih jadi kalau kalau nggak ngerti sedikit gitu aja itu udah udah langsung dianggap nggak ngerti gitu ya agak kejam juga sih. I think also maybe Ibu that the when we went to the supervisors and asked for their input. Could it be that they asked for a system like that? I'm not sure. Because we did design it a lot around their input, right, about what they wanted yes. Yes. Um, and what they felt could be could be done and accepted and so on. But would it, was that would that be a part of it too or not? 
They're uh, mostly giving the input on the items, but okay. the, the question is more on the on the response. Yeah. Okay. Why it is only yes or no? Yes. Why not? Is it one to five? Or is, well, first of all, I think it is because if you don't know a little bit of it, meanings you don't know. That's what I'm thinking. What do you think, Pa? If if there is a, for example, a hundred list of knowledge for a supervisor, if you don't know one point and you know 99.9, .9, then you still don't know and you need to learn. So we will not making a great thing, like knowing 25%, knowing 50%, knowing 75%, we wouldn't do that. Because if, for example, you choose one, meaning you only know 25. Oh, you know nothing. If you choose uh, grade two, meaning you know 25%, grade D, 50%, and it, 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 can, it could create bias because, because then one project manager give 30 for their supervisor, another project manager give, uh, give three, yeah. one project manager give three to a supervi uh, supervisor, and another project manager give four to a supervisor while the fact is the first supervisor is better compared to the second supervisor, but the leniency of the project manager is, the second one is more lenient. So there, there can be some of that also, yes. Maybe also another point would be that, you know, we are, we are a blue collar company. And so therefore the people who are, who are assessing the supervisors are ex blue collar workers also, right? <laughs> um, you know, our supervisors are blue, were blue collar workers who were promoted to supervisors and our project managers were supervisors. Um, so there's also, we can't make the system too complicated also. Because if you're going to have a scale, you need to explain what does one mean, what does two mean, what does three mean, you know, for every one of these items. Um, on the one hand, you get more, you get richer data, which I agree, that's that's the question. Why don't you try and get richer data than what you're trying to collect here? On the other hand, to get that richer data, um, it comes at a price of complexity and then explaining what all that means. Um, now, for the core competency, which is looking at soft skills, we have that five graduations, right? Those five uh, items, which is what are they? Tita Parna, like the one here is that we showed as the example. Right? We've got Tita Parna, Jarang, Karang, Karang, Suring, or Salalas. There's five different graduations. Um, we could have also have done that on a number scale as well. Um, but even, even doing this made, and this is an improvement over what we had before. Before we sort of had like a, a number scale, Ibu, I think, didn't we? We said like zero means this and one and two. Yeah, and three. I, think we had, I think we had four numbers, <coughs> zero, one, two, and three points. And I think that was complicated. We made it more simple by going to these five choices here because a lot of the employees couldn't understand it, what we were trying to do. So we've got that comprehension issue as well, um, where we have to balance between rich data and complexity and simple data and, and simple uh, and less rich data, you know, or basic data. Ini mungkin sebagai tambahan ya. Jadi, di ODG ini, meniti karinya ini mayoritas dari bawah. Jadi orang-orang terutama yang di lapangan ini, orang-orang yang sudah jadi project manager ini umumnya ngerti permasalahan yang dari bawah karena dia dulu berasal dari bawah. Walaupun ada satu dua ya seperti almarhum Pak Simron itu langsung dari project manager waktu masuk. Tapi dia di tempat lain ini ya Bu Sulbia. Dari ya, bawah. Sebelumnya memang ada pengalaman juga dari bawah tuh Bu. Oh iya. Sampai dia menjadi project manager. Mungkin nanti ada bisa bekerja di perusahaan yang supervisornya itu langsung nemplok gitu loh masuk-masuk langsung jadi supervisor gitu loh nah itu biasanya create problem juga karena 
supervisor tidak punya penguasaan lapangan dan bawahnya tuh nggak seneng. Hanya karena misalnya supervisornya tuh bergelar S1 masuk langsung jadi supervisor tuh it happens in other uh, companies that create problems with their worker because because the supervisor doesn't know the situation in the field. And also, we should point out that a lot of the expats are also ex Tukang district as well, right? Yeah. Jadi, so they're also not not that educated, the, the expats juga, right? Because they're also, they're the same version as the Indonesian NAP supervisors who've moved up to become project managers. They're the, they're the expats that have done the same thing. So they're also not too complicated, really. Um, di pelanggannya ODG ini kan beberapa memang orang asing ya. Jadi mereka maunya juga di... Dengan sesama orang asing gitu. Kalau pelanggannya orang Australia, ya pinginnya tuh pimpinannya di lapangan tuh orang Australia. Jadi kita juga hire project manager yang berkebangsaan Australia. Nah, itu umumnya asal-usulnya dari tukang juga dulu di Australia-nya gitu. Tapi terus karena dia punya kemampuan memimpin dan sebagainya, naik-naik-naik jadi project manager. Dan biasanya juga pinter ya. Jadi project manager itu harus pinter, harus di lapangan. Ya. But most of those, most of those experts, they've only had high school, and then they've gone to technical college, and then they might have done some additional learning along the way, like they might have done a, a course on project management, courses on estimation, and so on. But yeah. really, they're they're experts here because they've got a lot of deep technical knowledge and a lot of work experience in the field, where they've worked as supervisors and foremen and and so on, project managers. But their education level is also quite low. So we also face face pushback sometimes as well from them that um you know that they don't want the systems too complicated. Mm-mm. Itu oh, dinamikanya. Ini ada okay. lagi. Good question. Good question. Oke, okay, terima kasih Bu Ii, Pak Chris. Ini bahasa Indonesia. Uh, in bahasa in bahasa is that okay, Chris? Yeah, please. Menurut saya Alia. kondisi Pak Alia Alia ngomong sendiri aja. Oke, oh, oke. Okay, okay. Alia, Alia coba open mic ya. Oke, okay, uh, menurut saya kondisi pandemi ini cukup mengubah dinamika dunia industri dan organisasi. Contohnya adalah banyak karyawan yang memilih resign. Nah, tentu saja hal tersebut cukup merugikan perusahaan. Nah, pertanyaan saya adalah sebenarnya apa saja faktor yang menyebabkan hal tersebut dan apa yang dapat dilakukan oleh HR atau company untuk mencegahnya. Yeah, very difficult. Very difficult because for example, in what we've done here, we've done a pay cut for our employees. And uh, go back to last year in May, uh, May I think when we did it, everybody got the same pay cut. Um, and then when things got worse and the pandemic went on longer and we're talking about like August last year, which is crazy. It's still a year ago has been gone since then, but then the pay cut was made deeper again. So it's, it creates a challenge for HR because you start having a morale issue and then for your good performers, some of them might say, well, actually I can maybe get a job somewhere else. Um, maybe in a company that's not doing pay cuts because they're in an industry that's maybe less affected by the COVID virus. So um, we've lost some people because of that. And it's very hard because what do you do? You want to retain them, but I can't really go to them and say, okay, you don't get the pay cut, you know, and because you're important and I don't want you to leave, um, it's, it's very hard to do that. You know, it's, it's a very hard balance between looking after your talent, which, which really do deserve to be treated differently, um, and everybody else. And also then there's the people in the middle as well who are, who are just very good employees. What do you do for them? You know, you don't want to lose them. All that investment in training and their experience they've had in the business You don't want to lose those people, but there's only so many exceptions you can make. So quite hard. Um, about, I can't remember when we did this, but after about, I think about six months of the 
the 38% pay cut, I was very concerned about uh, my key team in the organisation. Well, I, it was Sophie as one of those people, right? And so I came to them and said, okay, let's, let's change the deal here where you will now work less hours. Sorry, uh, you'll work more hours and the pay cut will not be as much because I was very dependent on these, these managers um, for the success of the business. And, you know, by doing a 38% pay cut, we'd, we'd change to a four-day week. And that's not very efficient working four days a week. Um, to have meetings and so on, it's always let's get five people together. And, oh, they're off today. You know, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, oh, no, so-and-so is, we'll have it tomorrow. Yeah, but so-and-so is off tomorrow, you know, um, and I'm not here Thursdays. It's like, oh, it's very, very frustrating. So, you know, we, we, we modify that by making some exceptions for some managers where we would let them work more time. So they work five days a week. Their pay cut was a bit less because uh, I really could not lose these people. They, they were key to the business and I really wanted and I needed them to work more as well. It, was both, it worked both ways. But other people, it's been very, very sad. You know, we've had to let some people go because... I felt we couldn't make exceptions to some people. And there have been some young people who've left us, you know, good performers, and uh, it, it really is painful, you know, to lose those people. But at the same time, we've had to do it and we had to maintain uh, this pay cut. So to be fair to all the other employees, it's like they're striking that balance. How do you do it? How do you look after your good people but, you know, also keep – everyone else happy because everyone else is a lot of pain if they're getting a 38% pay cut. That's a, that's a lot of pain to, to accept every month. So um, it's been a real challenge it's trying to motivate those people. We try and give them, you know, interesting assignments to do. So we hopefully, hopefully they stay motivated, but we've lost some good people. And, you know, our competitors have picked up some good people, which is not good. <laughs> Ternyata ada yang diculik. Jadi ini terpaksa ya Pak Kris ya beberapa orang terpaksa harus dikurangi ya pekatnya, pekatnya karena Pak Kris membutuhkan orang-orang ini. And we justify those people because they they worked more hours, so therefore their pay cut was less. Because we were we were cutting people down to a four-day week um, and cutting their pay, uh, relatively speaking, yeah, in line with that reduction of four-day week. Okay. Ayo, murid-muridku yang pinter-pinter, nanya dong. Yang raise hand tadi siapa? Oh, Aziz, Azura. Azura? Azura, Raisa. Open your mic. And video, maybe. Uh, I'm sorry, but I can't open uh, my camera right now because of, I, I don't know. I think my camera is kind of broken right now. Uh, mm. I think I, I could just go to, to my question. Okay. So uh, if I may ask, so I have a few questions, but I think uh, the answers could be compiled into one. So if I may ask, what was the ratio between the expat workers and native Indonesian workers, especially in the supervisory or managerial positions? Was there any resistance that came from the Indonesian staff and having an expat as supervisors or decision makers in the company? Was there any policies or initiatives in the company that were deemed not suitable because it's, quote unquote, not the Indonesian way of doing things? And how do UDG face these obstacles? Uh, I think that, that's uh, my, my question. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I guess probably something that maybe I hadn't explained is that the business has been going, because it's been going for 30 years, it started as a multinational business. So um, people who joined the business joined a multinational business knowing that there was a lot of expats in it, say. But over, over that 30 years, the business has changed. You know, um, I wasn't here in 1990 when it was when it was first started. Um, but I, I do feel that over that period of time, our, our national competitors 
have gotten better and better. You know, as they've they've learned, you know, in better management techniques, they've they've taught their people, they've retained their good people, their good people taught their other good people, and so on. So, like us, um, you know, our workforce now needs a lot a lot less expat management because we've got a solid bench of good national uh, supervisors, superintendents um, in the business. So whereas when we first came here, I think the expats were managing a much smaller group of people and it was more direct teaching, you know, teaching Australian standards of how we, how we install things, teaching some theory on the job uh, in, in how we did things. So, you know, maybe in those days there was a need for more expats. But now, um, yeah, our Indonesian our workforce is, has better skills. We're trying to give them the soft skills to manage and step up and become, take more senior positions. Um, so it's a little bit different, but there, there still is resistance though. You know, sometimes when we have discussions, especially with my senior managers, We'll talk about like, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're talking about things. And then the question will come, well, do we need an expat for that job, right? And I've got to justify that and say, well, does it or not? Because it's not really up to me. It's up to my customer to decide if they're willing to pay because the expat costs more. Are they willing to pay that premium to have an expat? And some of those customers have expats working in them and they want to deal with an expat. They say, no, no, I want to, this has to be to like Australian standards or the technical detail is a lot deeper and we need someone with the, the technical background to do it and I want to have an expat. Fine, you know, then we'll provide an expat. But, you know, I have that question from my senior staff, do we need an expat on this job? And we'll talk about it. And sometimes the answer is, nah, no, if we don't actually, we've got our good national staff Um and we can do it, right? Other times it'll be, no, the customer really wants it or or the risk is so big that we want to put that extra money in there because we think it's it's a worthwhile investment to pay that extra money for the expat to do it. Um, so, yeah, so not, not resistance, but we do ask the questions and I'm really happy we ask those questions. And I know our business has changed dramatically now. Part of that is due to, at the moment, we don't have a lot of projects because of COVID. But if I went back only, uh, what? We built the Australian Embassy here in Jakarta. We did the electrical and the, and the smoke detectors. We would have had probably 18 expats here in Indonesia. And the business was about 700 employees, that kind of ratio. Now we have three expats in the business um, and we have the numbers you saw there for the national employees. Um, and if we scaled up, if we got enough projects, we would bring in, bring on contract employees. We could easily get to 600 employees, but <coughs> with 600 employees, we'd probably have five expats, not 18. So that's the difference. I think that's the difference in 10 years in the quality of our Indonesian workforce, what we're doing to train them and in the marketplace, the training they're getting in the marketplace, um, the skills they're learning, the experience they're getting, where we need uh, expats for certain situations, but it's not, if we went back 10 years ago, it would have been an automatic answer, of course we need an expat on this job, blah, 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 blah. You know? uh, it's not like that anymore. No, it really has to, it gets looked at very hard now if we, if we're going to have an expat uh, come in and do a project like that. Um, but our, our workforce, I would think, is not really resistant to it. Um, I think sometimes if I, if I speak to my supervisors, I trust that they would be open with me. I think they would say that often the technical help they get from our expats is they rely on it and they, they really appreciate it that someone can sit down and solve a problem that maybe they can't solve, you know, and say, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? This has worked for me before. I've done this similar situation. I did this. Have you tried this? And so on. So there's good learning that happens in that situation. And if I see 
our teams work pretty tightly together between the expats and the Indonesians. Um, depends on the expat, depends on the Indonesians, you know, but, but generally um, our culture is one where the, the, those teams work together. Um, there's a little tambahan ya. Uh, satu profi organisasi. Uh, kemarin kan kita bahas struktur matrix ya. Nah di ODG ini memang cocok sekali dengan menggunakan matrix structure itu. Because by using the matrix structure, kelihatan kan you can see ya bahwa karyawan tetapnya ODG itu sedikit. Dia akan membengkak ketika ada proyek-proyek dan itu banyak kan karyawan kontrak. Kondisi Covid sekarang ini kan tadi karyawan kontraknya sedikit ya karena proyeknya sekarang ODG sedikit terkait kemacetan proyek dari luar juga tapi sekarang sudah mulai proposal proposal sudah mulai masuk untuk kemudian memperbesar proyek nanti kalau memperbesar tinggal ditambahi proyeknya ke bawah itu kan ya kayak kuliah kemarin ya kemudian karyawannya kebanyakan kontrak terus another thing Pak Chris if you use the The expat project manager usually they only work for you on a project, right? And you will terminate them. I'm uh, not terminate, but by ending the by the end of the project, uh, they wouldn't work for you anymore. But for Indonesian project manager, you have to hire them and make them permanent, isn't it? Correct. Yes, uh, it's a little bit different dynamic. Uh, kalau dengan uh, orang asing itu. Dia hanya bekerja selama proyek, terus kemudian selesai. Tapi gajinya itu besar sekali. Ya, tapi gajinya yang besar itu dibebankan ke proyek itu. Di satu sisi, jadi kita tidak terbebani oleh orang bule itu ketika tidak ada proyek. Tapi kelemahan di sisi lain itu, itu menambah harga proyek itu menjadi lebih mahal. Tapi kalau kita pakai orang Indonesia, gajinya lebih murah. Tapi ada atau tidak ada proyek kita harus gaji dia karena peraturan pemerintah Indonesia kan harus kalau udah ini harus kontrak selesai kontrak harus permanen gitu ini juga dilema yang dihadapi kalau kita pakai orang asing dan orang Indonesia that's all I think that's all Pak. Ayo lagi nih muridku yang pinter-pinter. They are mostly smart Pak. What is it to be ya yeah, Indonesian lah Pak you know. <laughs> Ayo, murid gue yang pinter-pinter tanya dong. Oke. Okay. Ya Allah. <laughs> ya, <Yeah>, so cute. <laughs> Oke, okay, Pak Chris. <laughs> like <a> cat. <laughs> cute, Kalau malu-malu tuh berarti cute ya. <laughs> Ayo dong, murid-muridku. Oke, okay, Pak Chris, since they are millennial, so mostly this the student here uh, they are millennial and sometimes they ask in the class about uh, what leaders uh, perceive them as a millennial so uh, i think you have an experience a work with a uh, even even blue sco- blue scholars uh, right. they are millennial also right how did you manage them as a millennial millennials or gen z yang mana Yeah, Gen Z, also Gen Z. Gen Z is kind of, Gen Z, I think, I think still uh, 10 until 10%. Meanwhile, millennial has already uh, 80, maybe 80, 55, 80% in the uh, workforce right now. Maybe, maybe Sophie's got some insights here, actually. Mm-hmm. But what's your feeling, Sophie? What's your perception? <laughs> Sophie. <laughs> Untuk milenial ini memang uh, unik ya, <laughs> unik. Jadi uh, mungkin punya cara sendiri uh, dan mungkin lebih lebih apa ya, uh, lebih lebih terbuka ya, lebih terbuka untuk uh, pekerjaan dan uh, lebih banyak banyak juga inisiatif juga dari mereka sebenarnya dan uh, banyak juga input-input dari mereka bagaimana kalau gini itu lebih lebih sebenarnya lebih luas ya yang sebenarnya kita belum uh, oh belum kita pikirin misalnya oh dia udah kesana gitu loh pikirannya oh bagaimana kalau dengan ini dengan cara ini gitu kan oh that's good gitu loh uh, dia punya pemikiran uh, juga jauh ke depan gitu loh. jadi aku rasa dengan uh, masuknya milenial juga di dunia kerja itu juga input buat kita sebenarnya 
Jadi banyak juga uh, masukan-masukan dari mereka. Sebenarnya itu sih. Oke, okay, ada yang mau nambahin pertanyaan nih? Ini udah dipancing sama pertanyaan milenial. Do I add something as well? Um, in in developing the vision of the business, when we said that we wanted to contribute to the national development, I I put that into the vision because I also felt well, one I I, I really do believe that. But two, I also felt that uh, whether it's whether you call it millennials or Gen Z, that I think this generation wants to contribute to making things better. Yeah. I think it's it's more than just a job. Mm-hmm. Um, the concept of a job, I don't think is that attractive, but the concept of something where you can make things better, uh, I think that's more motivational. Um, so I... I deliberately put that into the vision for the business because I do want to encourage that generation to be working with us and I want to be working on projects where we can help develop Indonesia. Um, so I know people give millennials and Gen Z a bad rap. You hear it, people complaining, old people complaining, <laughs> right? But I think old people are complaining about young people for about 2000 years have always been complaining so i to me it's nothing new it's just old people that's what they do right but uh i don't i don't see uh i don't see that at all in all of our people i see our younger people working hard i see them putting in hours um sometimes they might be a little quicker to go home at night time <laughs> a little bit quicker than say some of the older people but Uh, they've got more happening probably in their social lives as well, you know, so it's just understandable. And, you know, a, a few of the people I know have things going on the side where they've got, like, their own business online or something like that as well that they're doing <laughs> at the same time. Or they're working on volunteering or something like that, and they're doing that too. So I understand. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to cut them some slack, you know, if they're in the office and they seem to be working hard and they contribute some some good quality content of what we do. They, they, input. they, they give us great input. So, no, I just thought I'd add that. Do you hear, you hear complaints about Gen Z? And I think it's all, it's just the media. It's just old people. <laughs> Don't listen. <laughs> Find a younger boss. Kayaknya puas puasnya saking ngapi ini, Pak. Itu ada pertanyaan tuh, Pak. There is an interesting question in the chat. Yep. Yes, from Gede Agus Abdi Wirajaya from YouTube as well. From what I I learned, I aku ngerti loh ini Wirajaya yes. ini. Namanya Chris, from what I've learned, when talented and experienced employees go to the company, lose their knowledge and expertise with them. Does ODG have any knowledge management system? Oh, well, that's a good question. No. The answer is no, we don't. We don't have anything formal like that called a knowledge, knowledge management system. Um, we try and do that with like our salespeople to ensure that their contacts and their relationships they have with customers are maintained in a in a like a CRM database where all their interactions, their meetings, their quotations, their uh, discussions, hope, hopefully, are captured in that database. If they leave, we've still got that. Um, but it's always a loss. It, you can't capture what what you lose when somebody does leave. Uh, you know, like the other day, we had a young guy, a millennial, right, uh, left us. He got a job in the telecommunication industry, I think, uh, where they now have a need for project management. He was a scheduler. So he did our schedules, did our, our planning for the projects. Uh, great guy. Um, and a future person in the business. So very, very sad to lose him. Um, and you can never replicate what the, the, the unique qualities that person had, the, the knowledge they had. Um, very hard. Uh, even harder when we lose long-term people. People have been, been with the business 20 years, you know. They've got a lot of skills and knowledge that we lose. People in the workforce, out the blue-collar people, um, you know, The only way we retain their knowledge is we try and encourage that passing on of knowledge from them to their subordinates so that those leading hands, those foremen are teaching their subordinates. Um, I mean, it's not a database, it's a human database, but that's 
by encouraging that culture of training and teaching, I guess we try and do that. But when someone with 30 years' experience leaves, it leave, leave, leaves a hole. You know, it's hard to replace that, that knowledge and skills that are lost. Um, but we don't, we don't have that sort of formal system that mentioned there, a knowledge database. Okay, Pak, uh, ada okay. question, Pak? <laughs> okay, Pak Chris from Azhara Diza. Good morning, Mr. Chris. Uh, Pak Chris, I would like to ask something. Oh, Azhara ada. Okay, silakan Diza. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chris. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so previously, you say that one of the effect of COVID is terminating an employee. So, what are the criteria of those? terminated employee and is it for contract based only or applied for the permanent and how the others employee responds to these issues? Thank you. Uh, many of the employees were permanent uh, because the contract employees, if we felt that their services were no longer needed, we could just let their contracts run out. And we did that in some cases. We did let some contract employees run out. But then we were left still with a core of people um, who we could not afford to be carrying, could not afford to keep, because essentially the business had been set up to do a lot more business. The company had been set up to do a lot more business than what it was doing. So really people were not fully employed in what they were doing. So we had to go to, to permanent employees and uh, it was very expensive, of course. And in fact, we had to negotiate with them to pay some money now and some money in the future. And uh, 100% of those employees have agreed to that deal, which also is very, uh, what would you say, um, very humbling for us that they, they trust us with that, that they, they've left the business, they've accepted a partial payment, and they've accepted that they'll get paid the rest later. Um, and myself and Sulfi and our finance director, Pa Agul, we feel uh, very heavily committed to these employees that we have to make sure they get their final payments and so on in the years to come. So we've stretched that out over a period. Um, what did it, how, how was the impact on the rest of the workforce? I think it was, it was hard for the rest of the workforce. These were friends, these are people, long-term people that worked in the business. Um, and it creates uncertainty. So an important thing we did was to communicate that the process has started and it's ended, why we did it. And so that people weren't worried, oh, am I going next week? Um, we announced that, no, the process has ended. Everyone can go back to their jobs now. But still, there's scars. People are hurt. And uh, it does affect morale. So we try and, you know, with what we can do, we try and you know, maintain that morale, maintain that team spirit, um, but not easy. And these, the people who are staying, of course, like I said, are on a 38% pay cut. So they're also, um, you know, that, that can reduce your motivation too. Did that answer the question? Is that? Yes, yes, clearly, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, good. Ari, please open your mic. Ari Mangesti, okay. Oh, I can't talk right now because there's another Zoom. Okay. Uh, Chris, good morning, Mr. Chris. Does uh, DG implements a hybrid system or not? From some of the literature I've read, I've read, there are several key drives of hybrid culture related to how company people behave, make decisions, and complete their work. One of them is leadership and communication. In the influence of leaders, what is the model of empathetic leadership that is needed by current employees and what do you think? Thank you. Uh, what do you mean by a hybrid system? Hybrid system mean uh, certain person. So the, this the the employee is not work in one 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 side uh, in one office. Sometimes uh, uh, certain uh, employees work in uh, non office in out of the office. Wherever I work from home. And the and the the organization manages the schedule. Sometimes a, a group of people come to the office every Monday, Thursday, 
Wednesday, the we have a, we have a schedule like that. Yep, we have yeah, a schedule yeah. like that. Yeah, that's, that that's, that's called hybrid, Chris. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so we have a system like that where yeah. uh, now in the phase, where we're at phase one, I think, with the government right now, we've got nearly everybody working here at the office. Um, uh, but before that, we had to manage that because we could only have 25%. So we had to manage that hybrid system of some people working at home and some not. Um, so the question is, what is the model of empathetic leadership that is needed by current employees? And what do you think, right? So uh, empathetic in terms of understanding the feelings of the other people. Um, one thing I've tried to do is, as a leader in this business is to encourage more regular discussions uh, because what I've, what I've discovered is that like good quality thinking doesn't tend to happen by sitting in a room by yourself. It, it tends to work really good in meetings, in discussions with people and throwing around ideas and bouncing ideas off each other. So we've tried to create more meetings more discussions to talk about things. And some people say, well, meetings are not good. We're a, we're a business that never used to have any meetings or very few meetings. But I, I found actually that it's it's a good way to, like I said, to learn and to, to make decisions and, and arrive at different areas. And, I mean, those meetings are full of empathy, you know, when we're talking about issues and so on. Um, yeah, I, I think that it that empathetic leader does need to get into the shoes of their employees and understand the issues they're facing. Um, so, you know, I hope we do that. I hope we do that enough. And I hope, you know, and, and for that reason, you know, for example, this 38% pay cut, we're trying to remove that as soon as we can, as soon as the conditions of the company improve, <coughs> because we realise um, the situation that our employees are in. So I would hope that, yes, that we do encourage that sort of empathetic uh, leadership and that empathetic discussions and, and, and uh, you know, feelings when we're together and having those meetings. And I think that's better than doing it any other way myself. It's my personal approach. Yeah, I think you did, Chris, because you're listening to the employee in your previous story. Okay. But, so, yeah, waktunya udah okay. habis, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge, Chris, and also Welcome. your experience, Bu Sylvia. Thank you very much, Ovin. Thank you very much. We are very enlightened and Thanks. real stories in the industrial world. Good, good. We learned thank a lot you, today. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. We learned a lot, Chris, from each other practices to some unique management uh, due to many blue colors <laughs> compared to white colors. Okay, this is such an interesting story. So happy working again and greeting healthy and successfully always. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bu I, ada yang mau disampaikan? Ya, cukup. Terima kasih. Bu Tati. Tati mana? Nggak kelihatan. <laughs> okay. Ini Bu Alin bukan ya? Bu Alin. Halo. Mana? Iya, Mbak. I, itu Alin. Alin tuh siap. Bu Alin Matusara bukan ya? Bukan, saya Pio oh, Sembilan, Mbak. Bukan, saya kira Bu Alin Matusar. Oke, oke. Bukan Bu Ii. Oke, baik. Silahkan eh, absen diri. dulu ya. Apa ya? Yeah, itu ya. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sudah, Mbak Ii. Mbak Ii mau sampaikan yeah, sesuatu okay. sama Pak Pak Kris? Thank you. Mbak Ii. Sudah, saya. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay.